Do you think I mean, music has a meaning? Oh yeah, definitely. It's good to be more spiritual so than anything. Uh, pretty soon I believe that they're going to have to rely on music to uh, like get some kind of peace of mind or satisfaction, direction actually, more so than politics because like, politics is really on the ego scene. You know? that's, why, that's why I look at it anyway. It's, it's not a big fat ego scene, for instance. Ego you know? scene. Well, yeah, it's the art of words, which means nothing. You know? mm -hmm. So therefore you have to rely on a more of an earthier substance like music or the arts, theater, you know, acting, painting, whatever. I, I appreciated what Sister Cardi B said. All right, so people people razz you a little for getting hip hop on board, but it's not like you sent out feelers in the hottest club. You don't have Bernie Sanders in the compound buying bottles recruiting us. Kids in hip hop come from working class and poor environments. People often talk about paying more in taxes. We are, she and I are probably both for the part that pay about 46% of taxes a year. She said, I'm willing to pay the taxes I pay. I would just like to see my money go into That's right. Education. She's absolutely right. In America, um, there will be blood, the movie. That we live that movie, that you can be rich. Well, rich is a long life with your children. Good. My grandparents were never rich, right? They raised three successful homeowners. We have never had to go back to them and ask them. That's rich. Rich is being able to spend the time with your family. Rich is not an endless pursuit of money. And I'm a rapper, right? I don't chain a hey, You know what? I've been trying to say that for several years. <laughs> And this guy just did it a lot better than I He also, I was uh, reading some things about you this afternoon. Uh, and in one newspaper interview, you mentioned that you'd like to have your own talk show. Around 1968, I tried to do that. I um, set out to convince people in television that I should talk to people on TV. And uh, I gave a list of the kinds of people that, uh, you know, when I made my proposal to the TV people, I'd say, I would have these kind of people on. What kind were they? Well, I don't remember who it was, but they didn't like the list. That was for sure. Who did, who did you make this proposal to? Uh, I think it was NBC. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. That's uh, kind of surprising they wouldn't go along with you. Uh, There's no accounting for taste. Really. Now, now but, but just take a second here and think again, uh, maybe this is putting you on the spot, but who would you, if you had a show, really, would you be interested in, in letting America take a better look at? Well, what I would have done at that time would be to take people who were in politics and put them on um, next to each other on a couple of chairs with people from uh, rock and roll or from the arts or, you know, just people that you wouldn't normally expect to confront each other and to let them hack it out. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it was always a kind of a, not necessarily a dream, but an interest of mine that if you had a talk show, and as it turns out, I have one. Um, New lucky guy. <laughs> but uh, to get somebody, uh, not unlike the, the, the gentleman we pantsed earlier tonight, uh, bring him down and maybe once a month, once a week, whatever, just let him, you know, talk mm -hmm. 15, 20 minutes and find out what the guy does for a living, how are things going, and, and uh, uh, what is affecting this person uh, that we see on the front page of the newspaper. I think so, that's a perfect format, and I think that somebody should do it because... Uh, uh, people who watch talk shows would probably like to be on them. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think that people who come to a live audience like this would probably like to just jump up here and start talking about whatever was on their mind. And, and probably because they have been watching talk shows for years yeah. and be very good at it. Yeah, and, and also because they saw things on talk shows that made them so bored that they knew they could do better. Yeah. So they should get a chance to do it. <laughs> Uh, that's, uh, yeah, maybe we'll do that one night. One of the things I do in my uh, daily news bath, which has been stunted today because I've, you know, this is prime news time for me, but I'm doing this interview instead of watching the news. But usually I watch uh, the Christian Science Monitor News, which has stories that nobody else runs. It's a really very good news program. And uh, last week, on the 75th anniversary of the Sykes-Picot Agreement, they gave this little discussion of how this piece of paper dating from the end of World War I still affects the way things are done in the Middle East today. Remember the movie Lawrence of Arabia? Of course. Okay, Lawrence gets out there and, and says to the uh, Arabs, okay, follow me and we'll, we're going to go and have a war with the Turks. We'll, you know, beat up the Turks and then you'll have freedom. Nice, nice idea. Well, what happened was while Lawrence is leading these guys to fight the Turks, two bureaucrats, Mr. Sykes and Mr. Picot, a French and British Two, these two bureaucrat guys made an agreement, not a treaty, that the French and the British would divide up the Ottoman Empire. The Arabs got screwed. And even though the Sykes-Picot Agreement is not something that people in the United States think about very often, the people in the Middle East think about it a lot because they can trace the source of all of their um, anger toward the West back to the day that these two guys got together and just said, okay, we're now going to slice up this territory. Could you imagine that there it would ever be such a thing as this book? 
Do you have any idea what's in this book? U.S. Cavalry, world's finest military and advent adventure equipment. Ah, oh, that's it. Killing is such an adventure. Look at this costume here. Just the mind boggles. Let's get dressed. We're going out tonight, dear. <laughs> and when we arrive, what an entrance. I try to get young people to vote. And I would say that uh, I registered 11,000 of them during the tour in 1988, and I've spoken about it, and I've put notices about it on albums and stuff like that, but I couldn't in all honesty claim that I've had uh, a major positive result in raising any kind of political consciousness in this country, because people who buy rock and roll records want to party, and they don't want to think about boring stuff. Oh, come on. Yeah, it's really depressing. If you stop and think about trying to get people to pay attention to what the government is doing or actually taking some personal involvement in it, it's hopeless because even if you got them to register, they don't know enough about what's going on to make a decision after they've registered. So maybe it's for the best if they don't register. So how do they become more informed? I mean, they become a news addict like you? And well, that news is so skewed anyway. Well, the... I'm watching the same skewed news that's available to everybody else. I don't have a, you know, any kind of secret information that comes filtering into my house. But what I've learned to do over the years is subtract the spin. And so if you flip from channel to channel and see the different ways the story is covered, you can average it out and get some idea of what's going on. And then the fact that certain stories are reported at all is very suspicious. And you learn to spot these, you know, why are they talking about this now? <laughs> For the two people who might not remember, uh, it wasn't too long ago that on Capitol Hill, as we say in Washington, you had frank and full discussions on the issue of record labeling with one Tipper Gore. We now propose one generic warning label to inform consumers in the marketplace about lyric content. The establishment of a rating system, voluntary or otherwise, opens the door to an endless parade of moral quality control programs. Did it make you feel better about her when it was revealed during the campaign that she was a drummer and an all-girl? band the wildcats did that give you a new no i never heard that one but uh, i can you didn't know that no, I... she got a new set of drums for for christmas this year <laughs> <laughs> the one day i wasn't watching the news <laughs> <laughs> now, does that give you a new feeling for yeah, her yeah i got a perspective on it now <laughs> have you heard from them since then well when it was revealed that i was sick i got a nice letter from uh the course has rock and roll finally gone too far well, a growing number of people think so. Today, they took their case to a U.S. Senate hearing. Their complaint? That rock lyrics and videos are crossing the line into trash and smut. Some parent groups want to rate rock records that may contain objectionable material the way movies are rated. Tipper Gore, wife of Tennessee Democratic Senator Albert Gore, called for voluntary warning labels on raunchy and violent rock albums. Frank Zappa was one of the rock stars who opposed the idea. We now propose one generic warning label to inform consumers in the marketplace about lyric content. The labels would apply to all music. The BMRC proposal is an ill-conceived piece of nonsense which fails to deliver any real benefits to children, infringes the civil liberties of people who are not children, and promises to keep the courts busy for years dealing with the interpretational and enforcemental problems inherent in the proposal's design. Zappa, whose albums are often sexually explicit, described Mrs. Gore and her supporters as the wives of Big Brother. You're, you're taking a very drastic step toward national censorship. And whenever censorship is mentioned, these wives go wild. You know, it's like the emperor's new clothes. Oh, this is not censorship, no. Censorship implies restricting access or suppressing content. This proposal does neither. And the media thinks, well, they're very, you know, they wouldn't lie. They're very cute. They're from Washington. Horn rock. But, um, if it looks like censorship and it smells like censorship, it is censorship, no matter whose wife is talking about it. It's censorship. Pyromania. No question. Burn a building. Burn, burn, burn. These right-wing people have this fetish about the right to life. What about the right to the life of an unborn idea? How much are you going to miss out on the United States if you won't let people think, say what they think, and do something about it so that people who don't think and are too busy doing something else can have the benefit of the people who think that is a stupid waste of resource to take the ability to think for yourself or to allow somebody who might think for you in a positive way to generate ideas that can turn into some income, for instance, to stop that from happening. It is incredibly short-sighted.
say you have four children? Yes. Pardon me? Four children. Four children. Have you ever purchased toys for those children? No, my wife does. Well, I might tell you that if you were to go in a toy store, which is very educational for fathers, by the way, it's not a maternal a responsibility to buy toys for children, that you may look on the box, and the box says this is suitable for five to seven years of age, or eight to 15, or 15 and above, to give you some guidance for a toy for a child. Do you object to that? In a way, I do, because that means that somebody in an office someplace is tell making a decision about how smart my child is. I'd be interested to see what toys your kids ever had. Why would you be interested? Just as a point of interest in this. Uh, well, come on over to the house. I'll show them to you. <laughs> Really? I, I might do that. <laughs> Have you ever met? It's not as easy as these people are making us think that they just got some criminal ass black kids with guns. It is not like that. We live in hell. We live in the gutter. We got us stacked up 80 deep in one building. You know, by the time you get out your house, you strap it to protect yourself. Because you're living in the same community that the police is carrying rifles and riot gear. Same, they need them riot, right? excuse my language, I'm so sorry. The same reasons they need the riot hat, the riot jacket, the flak jacket, the double vest, the 9mm Glocks with extra bullets, the tear gas, the mace, all that. Who do you think the police is using that against? Dogs? So we fighting the same villains that they fight in the street. But instead of them seeing us fighting villains in the street, we all villains. Is your generation the one that is picking up for where the Panthers left off saying, all right, enough is enough. The generation before us forgot about the fight. We're picking it back up. Not only forgot about the fight, forgot about us. Yes, and we're picking it back up. But at this level, all we're trying to do is unite. And right now, as a year, we got a million people that's listening. Now we can tell them something. Now we can try to get them that way, and we might lose some. We might gain some, but we would never even have that audience had we not said what was real. You know what I'm saying? And the main thing for us to remember is that the same crime element that white people are scared of, black people are scared of. The same crime element that white people fear, we fear. So we defend ourselves from the same crime element that they scared of. You know what I'm saying? While they waiting for, to, for legislation to pass and everything, we next door to the killer. We next door to them, you know, because we up in the projects where there's 80 in the building. All them killers that they letting out, they right there in that building. But it's better just because we black, we get along with the killers or something? We get along with the rapists because we black and we from the same hood? What is that? We need protection too. That's all I ever wanted to do, ask my mama. I wanted to go to college. I went to school all the way and was ready to go to college. The only thing that stopped me was money. The time we, all, of my, all the kids in my school was writing applications to go to college, I didn't have no lights and no electricity. And that ain't my mama's fault. You know what I'm saying? So when I think back to that, I'm not thugging for me. I'm thugging for my family. I pay all the bills. You know what I'm saying? I, I feed my whole family, wrong or right. I do. And I can't stop. You know what I'm saying? And if thugging is going to make me a million bucks, because it just got me platinum, then that's what I got to do constantly. And if it makes me feel, because right now, I feel satisfied. I don't feel like I've ever embarrassed myself or my people, you know, and nothing that I've done. And yet, no, I got the whole world fear me. You know what I'm saying? At 23, weighing 160 pounds, you know what I'm saying? And I ain't even started. I haven't even rolled my plan out yet, and they scared. I got the vice president know who I am, the president, every cop in every city, you know what I'm saying? And I haven't even started working out a plan. Someone said, where do you see Tupac 10 years from now? He said, hey, I just want to be alive. That's real for you. That's so real. I, can't, I made a metamorphosis, I'm a new person today. Because I used to strongly and honestly, honestly, I feel like I could represent my generation so much because I honestly did not care whether I lived or died. But now, I cannot die with people thinking I'm a rapist or a criminal. I can't leave until this is straight. You know, I'm not suicidal. I'm not, I can't go until y'all really know what time it is. And then after that, boom, it's all over. And we can see, you know, how this shit fall. But that's how it is. And the reason being is because if I can't live free, if I can't live with the same respect as the next man, I don't want to be here. Because God has cursed me to see what life should be like. If God wanted me to be this person and be happy here, he wouldn't let me feel so oppressed. He wouldn't let me feel so trampled on. You know what I'm saying? He wouldn't let me think the things I think. So I feel like I'm doing God's work. You know what I'm saying? Just because I don't have nothing to pass around for people to put money in the bucket don't mean I ain't doing God's work. I feel like I'm doing God's work. You know what I'm saying? Because these ghetto kids ain't God's children. And I don't see no missionaries coming through there. 
You know what I'm saying? So I'm doing God's work. While Rev Reverend Jackson do his shit up in the middle class and he go to the White House and have dinner and pray over the president, I'm up in the hood, you know what I'm saying, doing my work with my fucks. And just because I don't live there don't mean I don't go there. I got to go there because I can't hang nowhere else. The new hip-hop business paradigm, well, before I get into the business part, let's talk about hip-hop. As you know, 1973, Cool Hurt comes out, 1520 Sedgwick Avenue in the Bronx. At the request of his sister Cindy, he plays music for the kids of 1520 and 1600 Sedgwick Avenue. His crew was Pebbly Poo, DJ Clark Kent, Coke LaRock, the Nigga Twins, etc. Cool Hurt was a D DJ, oh, as a matter of fact, our first DJ, graffiti writer, b-boy, and MC. This is why we call Cool Herc the father, because the four original elements of hip hop seem to have been embodied in him. Go further, 1974, we get Africa Bambada, who then lays down the principles of hip hop, peace, love, unity, and safely having fun. Africa Bambada expanded the four elements from breaking, MCing, graffiti writing, and DJing to include knowledge and overstanding. We come up to 1976 and you get Grandmaster Flash who invents the crossfader on the mixer and scratching, cutting, blending of records and invented. Grandmaster Flash then goes on to put out a group called the Furious Five, two members of the group, Cowboy, I'm the C-O-W-B-O-Y, and Melly Mel, you may know him from The Message, it's like a jungle sometimes. It makes me wonder how I keep from going under. These two guys in particular, and that was five guys in the group, but Cowboy is the reason we say, ho, and throw your hands in the air. All that was created by a person. Melly Mel is the reason we have conscious hip hop to begin with. Melly Mel is the reason why or how MCs first looked at themselves and said, this is what we're gonna try to pattern ourselves after. See, today there are millions of MCs in the world, millions. But back in these days, I'm talking about the late 70s, there was only like five MCs in the whole world. Like five. And these MCs influenced everyone else. Go a little further, you get into the corporate structure with the song Rapper's Delight. Rapper's Delight sells two million records when it comes out, and suddenly hip-hop is legal. Before 1979, hip-hop was illegal and immoral. You couldn't break or b-boy. You couldn't dance outside in the street. It's called laudering. You'd be arrested, and many were. You couldn't bring your equipment outside and play because you were laudering, you were trespassing, you was... Uh, you know, disturbing the peace, so to speak, uh, and that was illegal. In addition, the cutting ch -ch 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 was immoral. You're not supposed to touch the turntable. You're supposed to put the record on the turntable, let it spin, and step away from the device. We, of course, had a whole different way of looking at it. And instead of just putting the record on, we started to interact with the record, with the whole machine itself. Here's where the tide changed for us. Everything in the mainstream had its own value to it that connected you to the mainstream. The dress was for your job. Your speech was for your boss, your employer. Your degree was so that you could function in society. We were the ones who said, we don't want to be part of none of that. We came out of the 60s civil rights movement in the United States. In the 60s civil rights movement, there were two arguments. One, integration. Should we be part of this system? Hell yeah, our fathers and mothers died, bled, and also built the country. We have a stake here integration. The other argument was separation. No, do for yourself. Get off your ass. Build your own nation. Why you keep asking the white man for help? These two arguments raged on. Integration won. Integration was held up by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who I call the king. Our king, Dr. King, or Martin, our King Martin, King Martin. King Martin believed that the true and just nation 
was a multicultural nation that had nothing to do with race, nothing to do with class. It had to do with the character inside of you. It had to do with your skill. It had to do with who you associate yourself with, not your color, not your class, not your religion, none of that. The king spoke and was assassinated. When the king spoke, one of the famous speeches that the king gave was the I have a dream speech. The I have a dream speech predicts hip hop. Now, I'm giving you two different things. One, keep 1979, our rise into technology, rise into the mainstream. Mainstream is rejecting us, saying, we don't want your kind around here. We're coming up saying, but we don't want your kind around here. And so now a parallel universe is created. But this parallel universe has roots. And its roots go into the 60s civil rights movement with the separatist attitude, to be honest with you. What, and, and instead of using separatism, let me use the word nationalism. Hip hop comes from out of a nationalistic mentality. Build your own nation. This would not take hold in the 70s and 60s, 60s and 70s, or and even 80s. But we felt it. <clears throat> we felt it. We knew this is the direction we were supposed to go. Now stop there. Just keep that in mind. And I get the wailing on these producers, and they all say, you know what? You're absolutely correct. We're all trapped. We're all trapped. Everybody here working for a check, and we all taking orders. What you want? Well, let me do what I can do to make the situation a little better. And one MTV executive will tell another MTV executive and suddenly things start working and now a change could be made. But the change ain't coming from within MTV. The change is coming in hip hop. And why hip hop? Because the people in MTV are hip hop. It's not that separation no more. It's Barack Obama. Candidate, Senator Barack Obama, running for president right now. He grew up on Public Enemy. Public Enemy, X-Clan, Poor Righteous Teachers, KRS, Queen Latifah. The paradigm has shifted. The corporate structure, or wait a minute, come back to entertainment, music. All my fans, all the fans of Criminal Minded are the executives of the major corporations today. It's not like it was when I wrote Criminal Minded and it was us against them. Now, it's us against us. And this is natural. People from the 60s will tell you right now, we fought against the system, then became it. The same beast we were fighting against, we became that beast. You look at, why is hip-hop looking the way it does? Take a look at Def Jam. Take a look at Interscope. Take a look at these, you take a look at Universal. Why is hip-hop so commercial? So take a look at the artists. We're all being polite. We don't really want to point the finger and call somebody out. This world is such a, um, and when I say this world, I mean it. I don't mean in an ideal sense. I mean in uh, every day, every little thing you do. It's such a, gimme, gimme, gimme. Everybody back off. You know, everybody's like, you taught that from school, everywhere. Big business, you want to be successful? You want to be like Trump? Gimme, gimme, gimme. Push, 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 push. Step, step, step. Crush, crush, crush. That's how it all is. And it's like, nobody ever stopped. Just, you know, I feel like, instead of us just being like, slavery's bad, slavery's bad, bad whitey, bad whitey. I mean, all right, let's stop that. And everybody's smart enough to know that, I mean, we've been slighted. And we want ours. And I don't mean by, like, uh, ours, 40 acres and a mule, because we passed that. But we need help. I mean, for us to be on our own two feet, us meaning youth or us meaning black people, whatever you want to take it for, for us to be on our own two feet, we do need help. Because we have been here. We have been a good friend. If you want to make it a relationship type thing, we have been there. And now we deserve our payback. It's like you got a friend that you don't never look out for. You know, you dressed up in jewels. Now America's got jewels and they got they paid and everything and they lending money to everybody except us. And it's like, you know, everybody need a little help on, on their way to being, you know, 
self-reliant. You know what I'm saying? That's the whole thing about the album, about the Special Olympics. Everybody need a little something and they to be independent. No independent person just grew up and was born independent. You worked and you learned teamwork and you learned cooperation and unity and struggle and then you became independent. And we have to teach that and instill that. And why is it that they want to do that? I mean, if this is truly a melting pot in the country where we care about and Lady Liberty got a hand like this, she really loves us, then we really need to be like that. And it needs to be the black kids. And if there's a, a white person who got money, then you need to help them. He need to help black kids, Mexican kids, Korean kids, whatever. But it needs to be real. And it needs to be before we all die and then you say, oh, I made a mistake. We should have gave them some money. We really should have helped these folks. It's going to be too late. You know what I'm saying? And then that's when you got to pay your own karma. And that's when God make you punish. When God punishes you because I feel like you know it's too much money here I mean nobody should be hitting lotto for 36 million and we got people starving in the streets that is not idealistic that's just real that is just stupid there's no way Michael Jackson should have or whoever Jackson should have a million thousand drupal billion dollars and then there's people starving there's no way there's no way that these people should own planes and their people don't have houses apartments shacks drawers pants If they earned it, then I, then I think that that's good, and I, I think that they deserve it. But even if you earned it, you still owe. Because look at me, I'm not, I don't have that mega money, but I feel guilty walking by somebody. I, I got to give them some mail. And if I know I got $3,000 $3, in my pocket, I feel like it's wrong to give that person a quarter or a dollar. It's wrong. Only you know what you got in your pocket. And that's wrong. No matter what they do, if they take it and drink it, they take it and drink it. But, I mean, you got you understand? And we all know how hard it is, and it's not about if you're good or you're bad. So since it's not about if you're good or you're bad, we know that because he don't got, don't mean he was bad. Or don't mean he's a criminal, or don't mean he's crazy, or a drug addict, or none of that. It just means he don't got. And ain't it bad that you got 30? I mean, can you imagine somebody having $32 million? 32. $32 million. And this person has nothing? And you can sleep? You can still go to the movies about, I mean... I mean, and then these, these are the type of people that get humanitarian awards. Millionaires. How can they be humanitarians by the fact that they're millionaires and there's so many poor people shows how unhumane they are? You know what I'm saying? And that, that bugs me. Not saying that when I'm not going to be rich and I'm not, you know what I'm saying? But I'm saying it's a struggle and I think everybody deserves. And I think there's a way to pay these people. I think there is a way. It just takes to be revolutionary. And it takes to, to do something out of the ordinary. You know what I'm saying? Like... I think that if we just said, okay, 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 I got an idea. No more porno buildings, you know what I'm saying? Let's build houses. Or no more polo games, let's build houses for poor people. You know what I'm saying? Or, look, okay, I know you're rich. I know you got $40 billion, but can you just keep it to one house? You only need one house. And if you only got two kids, can you just keep it to two rooms? I mean, why have 52 rooms and you notice somebody with no room? It just don't make sense to me. They don't. And then these people celebrate Christmas. They got big trees, huge trees, all the little trimmings. Everybody got gifts, and then somebody's starving. And they're having a white Christmas. They're having a great Christmas. Eggnog and the whole nine. That's not fair to me. All right, knowing what you know, what do you think about youth and gang violence in America, especially in the black communities and Hispanic communities? Youth and gang violence. Um, I think... I'm, I'm gonna get a lot of flack for it. I think gangs can be positive. It just has to be organized and has to stay away from being self-destructive to being self-productive. I think this country was built on gangs. Mm -hmm. You know, I think this country still is run on gangs. Republicans, Democrats, the police department, the FBI, the CIA, those are gangs. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? The correctional officers. Mm -hmm. I had a correctional officer tell me straight up, we the biggest gang in New York State. Straight up. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, um, it's, this whole country is built on gangs. Um, we just have to not be so self-destructive about it. Organize, you know. Um, but the violence. The violence, but it's violence in America. The, what, 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 what did the USA just do flying to Bosnia? We ain't got no business over there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's the same thing. How can they tell us not to have gang? You know what gang violence is? Mostly, and the, the people don't want you to hear this, somebody shoots your family member. So of course you retaliate. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Same thing the U.S. does, except nobody even shot their family members. You know, some, they see um, the, the somebody bomb a, a, a school and all these people get killed, so the United States feel like, ooh, that's messed up, we gotta go show them who's the real killers. That's the same mentality these gangsters get. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. until they stop that mentality, we won't stop. Or they won't stop. Because they watch this country to see what they do. America is the biggest gang in the world. You know what I mean? Look at, look at how they didn't agree with Cuba, so what was the, cut them off. 
That's what we do in the street. We block things off. I want to say stop the violence. I want to say the violence ain't good. And why, they know why can't not you good say that? Then? Because that's not realistic. I, I know it's not good. I, if anybody speak up against violence, it'll be the, the brother that got shot five times. Mm -hmm. I got shot twice in my hair, all up in me. Trust me, violence ain't cool. And they know violence ain't cool. Ain't nobody out there with a gun saying it's cool to be shooting people. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, it's certain situations where there is no way out. But there are situations where we can find a way out. But until we find that way out, we can't say mm -hmm. not to live this lifestyle. Now, too, we as black men, Puerto Ricans, whatever, so we stand up and start taking control of our communities, we can't get mad at anybody who stands up to do anything. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I believe that it's the community that needs to do something about it. Um, I do believe that there's um, um, a, a, a piece of liability on the drug dealers and the gangsters and the gangs and all of that, but these are not scholars. You know what I mean? We, we pay taxes. We pay taxes. This government is not doing anything to stop it. When the, when the people in L.A., after the rebellion, when we stopped and um, there was a truce, mm -hmm. nothing happened. Did we get any jobs? No. Did we get any relief? No. But every time there's a flood, an earthquake, or a thunderstorm, America will give mad millions to somebody because their house broke down. They don't care if we stop the violence or not. They don't care about gang violence. You know what I mean? Every time that Bosnia gets shot out, any place gets shot out, they send them a whole bunch of millions of food and packages from, from fuck, Somalia, everywhere. Everybody getting food but us. Mm -hmm. So we don't want the gang violence to stop. So they can't ask me to tell them to stop the violence because I can't tell nobody who's hungry what to do unless I'm ready to feed them. Then I'll tell them what to do. I hope that this interview will enlighten a, a lot of your, well, particularly the youth. They ain't going to be enlightened. Why not? They ain't gonna listen. They have to listen to somebody. I didn't listen. I didn't listen until I came here. Mad people was telling me, watch out, look out, signs up ahead. I said, yeah, I got this, I got this. <laughs> you know what I mean? I hope they listen. But don't under, don't listen. underestimate the youth of America. Oh, no, I got mad props in them. I'm, I was yeah. one of them, but I'm just telling you yeah. what's real. You know what I mean? Okay. A hard hand make a soft behind. It took five bullets for me to stop and see what was really going on. Well, we're gonna play this. And we, we need gonna, to. We're gonna play this interview. And we're and gonna we see. To. If they pick up on it. We're going to see. I hope they do. Okay. And I hope they look out for the next projects, the community projects, the albums, the movies. You know what I mean? All I'm saying is that, you know, I'm giving it my best shot mm -hmm. to do right by the community. Y'all do right by me. Mm -hmm. Support me, I'll support you. If I feel like I ain't got no support, then, you know, ain't no need in me being out here to put myself on front street. If I feel like I'm getting supported, I go all the way. Just mm -hmm. like I went all the way for Thug Life, I go all the way for the community. But mm -hmm. as soon as y'all turn y'all back on me, I turn my back on y'all. We won't have nothing to talk about. You know what I mean? I go ahead and do something crazy and cut my nose up and, you know, bug out. But um, y'all support I me, I support so. y'all. <laughs> now you know I ain't gonna go out like that. <laughs> I'm just saying.